Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Skoken and we're going to be taking a look at analyzing categorical data. I recommend that you pause the video now so that you can read the objectives and the vocabulary. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We do have an essential question listed, how do we tell a story about data? And the quick version of the answer is through graphing. However, that answer is going to be a little bit more complicated as we see the different types of graph that are graphs that are appropriate for different types of data. And what I'd like for you to do now is pause the video and make a note of what the difference is between a categorical variable and a quantitative variable and then turn the video back on and check your answer. So hopefully you remembered the definition either from your textbook or from class about categorical and quantitative or numerical variables and the type of values that they can take on. Just a caution, we're always going to be watching out for that kind of disguised categorical variable that looks like a quantitative variable. And here are some specific types of categorical variables that we need to be on the lookout for because they, they are disguised as numbers, but they're not actually numerical variables or numerical data. All right, let's take a look at a one-way table. We know that we love to organize data into tables, and one-way tables are called one-way tables because they specifically have only one variable. And in this case, you see the little sandwich uh, picture. If we're interested in what our class thinks about how we can best cut a sandwich in half, we might take a survey, for example. So imagine that there are only two ways to cut a sandwich in half. They are shown at the right. We can collect some data from our class. So imagining that we have 20 students in a class and we take a survey, we, well, let me just show you what a tally would look like. So I apologize for this, but a tally would be as we go around and we accumulate different values. So for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And for a rectangular, we might have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, what we haven't seen but we need to include anytime we have a one-way table or a two-way table is the total. And in this case, we have a total of 20. We asked 20 students their opinions, and that's what we got. So rather than have the tally, which is one way, again, that we would collect the data in the frequency table, we would actually have the values. And again, don't forget the total. We're always going to need the totals for calculating percentages. Now, from the frequency table, we can calculate the relative frequency and put that in the relative frequency table. So relative frequency is when we divide by the total. So for the diagonal or the students who believe in cutting a sandwich diagonally, we would take our frequency and divide it by the total. And we know that 12 divided by 20 gives us 60%. We can write it as a percent. Sometimes we're going to write it as a decimal number, so it kind of just depends. And in terms of students who believe that a rectangular uh, cut-up sandwich is best, we know that the result would be, in this case, we only have two categories, so it's going to be the balance, or 40% also can be written as 0.4 or 0.40. Now, the total of our frequency table was 20, the total of our relative frequency table should be 100% or 1.0, okay? So what happens next? Well, as they say, a picture paints a thousand words, so we would want to put this particular data into a picture, and we're going to remember that categorical, oops, got a little misspelling here, categorical, data can best be graphed either in a circle graph or in a bar graph. So we're going to create one of each. We're going to create a circle graph. 
we're going to create a bar graph and then we're going to create something else that we haven't really talked about yet but it'll make sense when you see it and that's called a segmented bar graph that's kind of a cross between the two let's get started on our circle graph here's what our circle graph would look like and it's not the degrees are not exact but it's close enough and we can see that we're putting in the label and we're putting in the percent. That's what we're typically gonna do. We know that when we actually create the circle graph, we would use a degree to actually draw it properly with a protractor, or of course we would use software. Okay, pause the video and try to draw the bar graph now. Here's a look at what the bar graph would look like. So we're representing 60% diagonal, 40% rectangular. And again, this is with the relative frequency and it could just be with the counts the shape is going to be the same either way just FYI okay now for the segmented bar graph so here is a look at our segmented bar graph and what's different about that segmented bar graph compared to the bar graph is that it totals up to a hundred percent so instead of comparing parts to parts which is what typically bar graphs do we're comparing parts to a whole or the full hundred percent and in that way, the segmented bar graph is similar to a circle graph. So you can see that the two bars are stacked on top of each other and they total up to 100%. This segmented bar graph is typically always relative and not just the counted values like we might see in a bar graph. Just a reminder, the reason that we show percents instead of counts on a lot of these types of graphs on the categorical graphs is because our denominators might be different or we might have taken a survey of different numbers of male and females for example and you'll see it's a lot more meaningful when we look at that two-way table which we're going to see in a minute but I just wanted to bring that to your attention so usually we're going to see percents on these as opposed to the actual counts Last of all, I want to emphasize, regardless of what kind of a graph you're creating, you always need to include the information so that it can be read properly. So in this case, I would have preferred to have the full word spelled out, rectangular or diagonal, but I didn't have a lot of room. Another choice, of course, is to include a key. So just remember, provide as much information as is necessary so that the person reading your graph knows what story you are telling with this data. Let's take a look at the next page now. Important reminder what to include when we graph. First of all, we always want to draw and label the axes. Next, we always want to scale the axes. So if we're dealing with a categorical bar graph, for example, the scale might just be labeling what the bars are along with putting in the percents or the counts appropriate. And last of all, we're going to actually draw in the representation of the data. In addition to all of this, it doesn't hurt to title. So just remember, you can always title your graphs as well. Okay, we definitely want graphs to be able to tell a story for us, but sometimes we recognize that graphs can be deceptive and the deception can either take place on purpose or accidentally if someone didn't make a very good graph. So how is it that graphs might be misleading to us? I want you to take a look at the first two graphs. So pause the video, take a look at the first two graphs and see if you can jot down your thoughts about what might be deceptive about these two graphs and then turn the video back on to check your answers. All right, I don't know if you thought of the things that I've made a note of, but on the graph on the left, we see the cast graph. It's a pictograph. And if we look at it at a quick glance, it appears to us that 5.2% of children end up with spinal injuries. But that's not actually what this graph is saying. What it's actually saying is that top traumatic orthopedic injuries for which children are hospitalized. So that means we're looking only at orthopedic hospitalizations. Of the orthopedic hospitalizations, 
percent of them are related to spinal injuries. So it's changing our denominator. It's not looking at all children or even all hospitalizations, but orthopedic hospitalizations. So very interesting. We have to read this one very carefully to really get the meaning behind it. In terms of the one on the right, percent who agreed with the court, notice that the difference between 62 and 54 looks tremendous. And we know that that is only the difference of 8%. So if this had been shown with a scale from 0 to 100, it would look very, very similar. Not much of a difference at all. But here, it's super exaggerated. So we need to pay attention to where the vertical axis begins and ends and see if the the differences are being exaggerated by the person who drew the graph. And maybe they have an agenda in trying to get us believe one way or another. So let's take a look now at these other two graphs. These are both pictographs, and you can probably spot immediately that the one on the left, the big problem with it, is that we see a volume difference. That's what our eyes go to versus height. So we need to be very cautious about that. In this case, only the height should be taken to account, the relative height. So this is basically doubled as opposed to what looks like maybe four or four, five times as large in 2001 compared to 2000. Now, when it comes to the graph on the right-hand side, <laughs> this is kind of interesting also because one banana is much wider than one apple and is much wider than one pair of cherries. So again, our eye is responding to the volume. And even if we looked at it based on the width, it's deceptive. Both are deceptive. So these are some of the things that we need to be on the lookout for when we are consumers of data that is presented to us in graphs. We need to be very cautious, very careful, so that we can be savvy consumers of data. Well, we took a look at a one-way table, and we remember that that is a table containing only one variable and the different values that that variable can take on. A two-way table is, in fact, a table of counts where we're summarizing data that shows the relationship between two categorical variables. So we're going to take a look at our class data and we're going to summarize what grades each of our students are, male and female in total. So pause the video now, pull out your class data and put your summary information on this. Remember that your row totals and your column totals should total up to the same number. So pause the video now and fill in the data. All right, so here's the information from our class data. And you can see that we have some 10th, some 11th, some 12th graders. We have male students and female students. And we've drawn our totals in for all of them. Let's take a look at the marginal relative frequency. And just a reminder, relative means it's going to be a percent. We're going to express it as a percent. So marginal means we're just looking at the margins and maybe what we want to do is we want to see what the distribution is between female students and male students. So we're still going to use the grand total of 36 as our denominator but we're going to have the split between female, male and let's see what that looks like. So we'll have Female is 13 out of 36, and male is 23 out of 36. And when we calculate the percentages, you can see that we have 36.1 female students and 63.9 male students. Once again, those should total up to 100%, and they do. At this point, we could use a bar graph or a circle graph to demonstrate or to display this data. And what we would be displaying is the distribution between male and female in our AP Statistics group. Notice that this information only gives us 
it, the female male split it doesn't tell us anything about the grade level of any of these students and if we wanted to do that we would have to look at the other margin and look at the column totals for grade level still dividing by our grand total of the number of students that we have in AP Statistics, which is 36. When we talk about joint relative frequency, you may have heard of this before, but it was called an AND relationship. And this is where we would say, what percent of students is female and in grade 12 of our AP Statistics group? So we would go to the female line and see where it intersects with the grade 12 column and that would give us the number nine you can see where they the row and the column intersect so it would be female and grade 12 and that would be nine out of 36 which is 25 percent so 25% of our students are both female and in grade 12. That's what we mean by joint. And remember, relative frequency is, once again, when we express as a percent. When it comes to conditional relative frequency, what we're going to be looking at is just one of the columns or one of the rows and then seeing what the distribution is for that particular row or column. An example of this would be if we decided that we were interested in looking at the distribution of grade level for males. And what that would look like is taking the total of males as our denominator. And this is what the conditional relative frequency distribution would look like. For the total males, 23, in AP Statistics, what is the distribution by grade level of the students? And it's going to be 13%, approximately 26%, and approximately 61%. So you've got some practice problems that will allow you to practice this further. Make sure that you know the difference between marginal relative frequency, joint relative frequency, or and frequency, and conditional relative frequency. And we're going to be looking in the future, we're going to be looking at these as probabilities also. Let's take a look at the next page of notes. We've come to a check for understanding, and I'd like for you to work on this. You've got the full page to work on it. And what you will be doing to check for your accuracy on this check for understanding is you're going to go to the solutions section in your textbook. That's at the back of the book, and you can find that using the table of contents. All of the check for understanding exercises from your notes are also in your textbook and the solutions to those and the answers to those can be found in the back of your book and again in that solutions section. So I'm going to have you work on that now, pause the video, work on this, and then go check for accuracy in the textbook solutions. Then you can come back to the video and resume. Once you've checked your check for understanding answers, you've got your practice problems that we will be working on in class together. So you can stop now if your notes are complete and I'll see you in class.